Much COVID-era lockdowns were put in place with the idea of keeping the public safe and holding the spread of the virus, but they ultimately led to the shuttering of schools and small businesses, and many Americans are still feeling uh, the pain of that. Our next guest is now posing the questions, were the, were, uh, posing and answering the question, were the lockdowns even worth it? Joining us here now for more is CNBC contributor Bethany McLean. She's also co-author of the new book, The Big Fail, What the Pandemic Revealed About Who America Protects and Who It Leaves Behind. And your co-author on that is uh, my friend uh, Joan O'Sara, two of the best writers I know collaborating here. So congratulations on the book. Uh, Thank you. It's a very interesting argument. But let me go back and let's spin the clock back to the spring of 2020 and the summer of 2020. At that time, there was no vaccine. At that time, there was very little known about the virulence of this virus. What was known was that it was affecting a lot of people. So in, you argue that the, that the lockdowns didn't really work and, in fact, did a lot of damage. But at that time and into and through 2020, Weren't the lockdowns an understandable public policy response to what was going on? So I think we can all draw the line as to when an understandable response became a mistake. And I agree, it's a little bit of a, of a slippery line. But I'd argue that we knew the costs were too high long before the end of, of 2020. And the reason I say that is because the data was pretty clear early on that kids weren't affected by this nearly as much, that they weren't dying from this, and that the terrible outcomes were clustered in nursing homes and in people who were older and in people who had pre-existing conditions. And so I think it was pretty clear early on who needed protecting and, and who didn't. And I also think it was pretty clear early on who was bearing the costs of lockdowns and who wasn't. In other words, if all of us, and I use the word us broadly, had lost our jobs, been unable to work from Zoom, and been told we had to go be essential workers out on the front lines, you might have heard a lot more pushback to lockdowns in the media than and and elsewhere than you did. And so then, then my, my natural follow-up is we were, we were sort of protecting everybody when really we needed to protect the vulnerable who were the elderly, those in nursing homes, uh, who were in assisted living facilities and so on and so forth. So why then did lockdowns have such, um, such carry uh, in many states why then did schools stay locked down as long as they did in my in my community for the full year of the 2021-22 school year? Yeah, so schools in America stayed closed in a way that is in quite con quite a contrast to places uh, in most of the rest of the world. And I think we have to ask ourselves why that was, given the incredible amount of damage that that has done to really the least privileged children in our society and the people we all say we really want to protect the most. I think there are a few reasons for it. I think teachers were legitimately afraid, and I don't think public health officials did a good job of communicating what the real risks of this virus was and how it was transmitted, nor did we see a lot of huge headlines when it came out that transmission rates in schools that were open were actually were actually pretty low. I think the children of a lot of priv privileged people were able to go back to school because private schools opened, whereas public schools didn't. Just think of California and Gavin Newsom. His kids were in school while the public schools in the state remained closed. And I think all of us began to make this incredibly unfortunate um, 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 connection between what your politics were and what your stance on the virus should be. So once Donald Trump said, I want schools reopened, it became the thing to say, oh, no, no, schools can't be reopened just to show your opposition to Trump. And really, if you think about it, isn't, isn't that a tragedy? A lot of this book, Bethany, is really about the healthcare system. How much of the motivation behind it um, and was to talk about those failings? What are the failings? And what, if anything, have we learned about it? Because the system seems to me today to be exactly what it was, you know, three, four years ago. Good point. 
I'm not sure we have learned anything. I've become a little more cynical as you guys probably have too over the course of my career over what we learn and what 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 actually what actually changes. But yes, there was a study that came out after our book was published, unfortunately, that associated higher rates of COVID deaths, not to lock lockdowns or lack of lockdowns in the United States, but rather to trust in the system and access to healthcare beforehand. And so one of the points of our book is that the pandemic really exposed a lot of pre-existing conditions in the US that almost guaranteed that COVID was going to hit us particularly hard. And one of those is the dismal state of health care for many people in this country. When we talk about the dismal state of health care, are we talking about government provided health care? Are we talking about the private sector and the way that that's run? What would you say would be, you know, uh, the policy recommendations, if any, to come out of this? I'd talk about really the conflation between the two. We don't, we we pretend that the hospital sector is for profit. And in some ways it is, and even big not for, well, it obviously is, we big publicly traded hospital chains. And a lot of not-for-profits are now essentially run as, as, as for profits as well. But we don't do a good job of saying, what are the preconditions for a hospital to be able to thrive? We pretend that it's kind of a free market referendum, but it, but it, but it really isn't. The government reimbursement policies dictate which hospitals survive and thrive and, and which ones don't. And the hospitals that actually do the best are the ones that are the most skilled at taking advantage of government of government reimbursement systems. So I think the, the larger one of the larger points of our book that we tried to get at is the responsibility of government to set the right rules, both for the, for the free market and for society.